for our communion hymn this morning. Uh, we're going to uh, sing one day, and after that we will um, pray, uh, pray together. And then, uh, if you have not already, the communion um, emblems are in the back of the auditorium, if you have gathered. So as we sing the song, if you don't have them already, if you're at home, you can gather those as well. Uh, let's sing together one day as we prepare our time around this Lord's table. such trouble, go to such extremes. He didn't want to be the one to let the starter die. What kind of bread do we need today? Whole wheat, white bread, oat bread, brown bread, rye bread, sourdough bread, sprouted grain bread, one of my favorites, crusty bread or white or soft, or soft bread. See, they, there are days that we all need different types of bread. 
Jesus came to be the bread of life for us. He is everything to all of us. Jesus' disciples had gone to buy bread while they were in Samaria. And Jesus had been talking to the woman of Samaria while they were gone. And he shared with her about the living water and that would change her life. And when the disciples inquired if he had something to eat, he told them, I have bread to eat that you know nothing about. Think of an old man who has lost his wife. Most of his friends are gone as well. He doesn't get out much now. And What kind of bread does he need? There was a young woman. She's joyful, bright, bright, energetic, but afraid of being alone. She feels a pull towards God, but she doesn't know where to start. What type of bread does she need? She, she doesn't, some doesn't want to get involved in, in a cult. They, they say that's all that Christianity is. There, but there's just something within her that is unfulfilled. What type of bread does she need? A young teen, not very athletic. His dad has left him years ago. He isn't sure where he really fits in in this world. He has lots of questions about life, but doesn't know where to ask them. He's lost in so many ways. What kind of bread does he need? Some need a kind word. Some need a helping hand. Some need a prayer. Some need direction. Some need answers. Some need challenges and joy and guidance. But all of them need Jesus. He is the all in all, the great I am. He will be whatever you need him to be. But if we know Christ, we have the Lord inside of us. That He He is wanting uh, wanting us to share what we know and, and not just not just enjoy. See the story in First Kings chapter 17 tells of a woman who had some bread, but it was her very last, right? And um, she had re she had received just enough to keep her and her son going, and because she helped out the prophet. And we must keep the starter alive. And share lots of bread with lots of different people. They all are hungry for the bread that only Jesus Christ can supply. So as we come to the table today and see how Jesus broke the bread and shared it, he poured the juice and he shared it. His body, his blood, it must be shared. Let's pray. Let's pray to God and Father. Thank you so much for the opportunity you give us to stay to come in this place. We come now around the Lord's table. Well, there's so many people around us that need so many different things. And we have something. Something that needs to be shared. And Father, just help us to see. Open our eyes that we can see those around us who really, really, really need you. And Father, help us to help them see that you're the answer. Father, as we gather around this table today, as we, we come to remember your great sacrifice for us, Father, we just ask you now to bless this bread, which re represents your body. We ask you to bless this cup, which represents your blood. And Father, we, we take it now so that we can remember and not forget that you did this for us. You did this for our sins so that we may be redeemed. We pray all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's now take the, the bread together. We fill in that. Take the bread. Let's now take it together. Now take the cup, the juice that represents Jesus' blood. We also gather resource day to uh, bring our tithes and offering as an act of worship as well. So as we gather this part of our service, um, in back of our tourism is the offering offering plates. And if you're at home and or watching or maybe not have it today, you can give through our app or our um, our website. You can give through your own bank, you can mail it here, or you can bring it by sometime this week. But now is our act of worship. Let's just pray together and pray over these offerings. All right. Do it, do it, do it. All right. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much today uh, for the opportunity you give us to gather in this place. And Father, now to come to a portion of our worship where we bring back a portion of what you've given us. And Father, we just pray today that, um, that each of us 
are good stewards of the time and of the resources and the income that you give each of us. And Father, as we now come as an act of worship, bringing this back to you, Father, we just pray that you would take it and you would multiply it and you would use it for the building up of your kingdom. Father, we pray that for those today who are able to give and those who are not, but Father, we pray that all of it would, would be used for your kingdom work. We pray all these things this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time, kids are dismissed to go to Children's Church. gather back here this morning and to continue this series that we have called At the Cross. And uh, if you haven't done it yet, you can pull out your message notes um, inside your bulletin and follow along this morning. Maybe get a pen so you can jot down some notes um, as, we, as we travel along this path. Um, as you're doing that, remember Easter Sunday is two weeks from today and on April the 17th. And it's the day that we come together to celebrate uh, Jesus Christ. Um, but here's the truth. There would be no Easter Sunday if there was not a Good Friday. Um, there is no resurrection without the crucifixion. During a series, we've been looking back some over 2,000 years ago and trying to get this fresh perspective uh, of the cross through the eyes of those people who were at the cross with Jesus. We began the series by looking at through the eyes of the Roman soldier, the guy who orchestrated the execution of Jesus. Um, what we discovered was it's only through God's grace that we can break through a hard and cynical heart like that of the Roman soldier. Then two weeks ago, we, we were looking to, through the eyes of a devoted servant, right? Through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. And we discovered what it takes to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And today, I want us to look at the cross through the eyes of probably the most distraught person who was there at the cross, through the eyes of the only person who had been there both at the birth of Jesus and at his last breath. And we're going to look at the, cro at the cross through the eyes of Mary as a heartbroken mother. Now, when I say the name Mary, there's a lot of images probably going to our, in, through our minds, right? Uh, what was the first thing we think about when we think of Mary? Uh, someone asked um, a question out on social media, and it was interesting um, that... It, that, that it was asked and what the response was. So when you think of Mary, look at this side. When you think of Mary, what are some images that come to your mind? Is it the Christmas Mary holding the baby Jesus? Or is it the crucifixion Mary who's, where she's standing at the foot of the cross? Or is it the Holy Mary who has the angelic circle above her head? You know, um, the Holy Mary. Uh, which one comes to your mind first? And probably each of you probably have something that comes to your mind. But when they took that survey... 81% said the Mary that they think of when you say the mother of Jesus was the Christmas Mary with the shepherds and the wise men and the manger all around her. But I want us also to understand there's a lot more about Mary than just the birth of Jesus. And that's all great, right? It's, it's important. But I want you to understand there, there's more to her story. She, she lived a full life. Mary delivered Jesus when he was just... Um, delivered Jesus when he was just a teenager, when she was just a teenager, and he was crucified at the cross. She was probably just in her mid to late 40s at the time. A lot happened in her life between the Christmas story and the cross. Now, another question <coughs> I have for you is this one. True or false? Jesus was the only child. False. That's false, right? False, right? <coughs> it's false. Many people don't realize that, realize that, especially if they haven't grown up in the church, that Jesus did have siblings. The Bible tells us that Jesus had four half-brothers and an unknown number of half-sisters. Now, it's important to remember that Joseph wasn't Jesus' biological father. Uh, that's why they were half-brothers and half-sisters. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mary was still a virgin when Jesus was born. But after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had other children. And can you imagine for a moment having to grow up with Jesus as your older brother? <laughs> having to live up to that standard? Hey, uh, can you imagine? 
Uh, can't you be more like Jesus? Uh, oh, you mean the Son of God, right? Uh, that'd be difficult, right? That'd be difficult to live up to. But what, what we're going to find out is that Jesus' mission, his life, <coughs> caused a lot of people. A lot of people caused a lot of tension. And we're going to see that in just a moment. One final question about Mary. Which of these things is not true about Mary? Not true. Not true. Mary was a teenager when Jesus was born. At one point, Mary was ashamed of Jesus' ministry. Mary was at the cross when Jesus died. Or Mary is holy and without sin. Which one is not true? Of course, most of us probably realize that the last one is not true, right? Some people believe that Mary is maybe on a higher level than the rest of us, that we can pray to her, but that's not true. Nowhere in the Bible are we told or led to believe that Mary is somebody that's higher or that she was perfect or that it's okay to pray to her. Now, I want you to understand this. Mary may have been chosen for an extraordinary task, to be the mother of Jesus, be the mother of the Messiah, but she was just an ordinary woman. That was, makes it possible for you and I this morning to relate to her. Mary wasn't wealthy. She was engaged to a simple carpenter. Um, his name was Joseph. Like you and I, she had real struggles. She had real doubts. She had real problems. Now, we don't know exactly when, but at some point, um, before Jesus began his public ministry at 30, something, sometime before then, <coughs> Joseph died. Mary, at some point, became a widow and a single mom. She was doing the best she could to raise a family by herself. Whatever you think of Mary, understand this. Mary is like you and me. She had real fears. Mary had real flaws. She had real worries. And if you can get through the myth and find the real Mary, she always points us to Jesus. Now, even though Mary knew that her son was going to be the son of God, she had no idea what was coming for her. That the baby that she was holding in her arms in Bethlehem would one day go to a cross in Jerusalem and die. Only a handful of people were there. That Friday afternoon with Jesus, his disciples, they weren't there with him. Jesus' disciples, Peter and his crew, they had all ran away. There was only a handful of people who were actually there with Jesus for those six hours that Friday that, that as he hung on, the, on that cross. But one of the people who was there was his mother. Here's her account. We find it in the front of your notes in the Gospel of John in the New Testament, chapter 19, verse 25. It says this, Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother, she's the first one mentioned, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple that he loved, and they believed since the gospel of, this was in the gospel of John, that this was John they were talking about, he said to our dear woman, here's your son. And he said <coughs> to his disciple, here's your mother. And from then on, the disciple took her into his home. Now, hold your finger there just for a moment before we go move to the next page. In Mary's experience at the cross, you and I can discover what it really means to be a fully faithful follower of Jesus. You see, Mary had to make a really incredibly difficult decision, a decision no one else really had to make. She had to decide, was she going to be Jesus' mother or was she going to be Jesus' follower? Was she going to hold on to Jesus as her son or is she going to see him as the Son of God and make him her Lord? So, now, that, there, there's some of here maybe today that you believe in Jesus. You're a Christian. <coughs> but if you're honest today, you're not really, really following Jesus. He's not really the leader of your life. He's not really the Lord of your life. He's not the one calling the shots when it comes to your career or your relationship or whatever area of your life we're talking about. You're following someone, but you're not truly following Jesus. You're following someone other than God. And it's led you, you to a place that you are today, to a place away from God and away from God's best for your life. Or maybe you're here today, you're not yet a Christian. 
Maybe you came with a friend, or maybe you, you're not sure what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And it's okay. It's okay to be in that place. And uh, maybe today you want God to start calling the shots, and I want Him to be the leader of my life. And that's what we're here for today. That's what we want you to come to the realization that you need Jesus. <coughs> from Mary's life and from her experience at the foot of the cross, what it, what it really means to be a follower of Jesus and the real blessing that comes with it, that's what we're going to find out today. So open your notes to the inside and today. Let's learn from Mary what it really means to follow Jesus. You don't have to look far in our world to see Mary being um, venerated like on a statue or stained glass or being lifted up for the rest of us to see, but I think it's vital for us to understand that Mary was just an ordinary woman that God chose to use in a very extraordinary way. And I think it's important because if Mary was extraordinary, if she was really that, there's nothing that we can learn from her. If God only uses special people, then he probably doesn't use a person like me. The great thing about God is that he always uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. In fact, he only uses ordinary people. And, but here's the key. We have to choose to follow him for him to be able to use us in this way. So let's learn today how we can learn from Mary how an ordinary person who chooses to follow Jesus can be used in some extraordinary ways. What can we learn from Mary uh, about following Jesus. Here's our first lesson. Write this down. Following Jesus begins with obedience. It begins with obedience to Him. Letting Him be your leader. Now listen, just saying you're a Christian does not make you a follower of Jesus. Now, I've known plenty of people who say, hey, I'm a Christian, but you can tell by the way that they live their life that they really aren't following Jesus. You see, being born into a Christian family, going to church, reading your Bible, being a good person, those things don't make you a follower of Jesus. More than anything else, the number one characteristic to being a follower of Jesus is obedience. Obedience. It's saying, Jesus is my Lord, and I'm going to do what he tells me to do. And that's what we see in Mary's life. Picture this. She's a young teenage girl. She's engaged to be married, and then she finds out that she's pregnant, um, that she's pregnant not by her fiancé, but by the Holy Spirit. Now, she gets, she's got to explain to her parents uh, that, you know, I'm pregnant, and it's not Joseph's. Uh, this is scary. This would be shameful to her. They could stone her to death for this. She has a real problem. This is happening to her. How would they respond? Let me show you how Mary responded. She responded with obedience. In fact, Luke chapter 1, verse 38 says, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. You need to underline those words. I am the Lord's servant. Mary said, okay, God, whatever you say, I'm going to do it. I trust you. I'm going to obey you. Now, to be fair, when she spoke those words, she didn't know that her obedience was going to lead her to the very foot of a cross watching her son die. She didn't know that her obedience was going to be that. But at every step in her life, Mary trusted God. And she said, okay, God, I'm going to listen to your voice above every other voice. And I am going to follow you above every other person and above every other thing. Let me ask you, have you made that decision for your life? Have you told God, God, with whatever you tell me, I'm going to do it, whatever it is. Wherever you tell me to go, I'm going to go. I'm going to trust your voice above every other voice. Not picking and choosing what parts of the Bible that you listen to and what parts of the Bible that you don't want to listen to. Not choosing when you're going to follow God and not follow, but saying, God, I'm going to follow you no matter what you say. I'm, and it's interesting, though. Jesus is the primary way that he can tell if we really love him. Not by how many times we go to church or how many times we read our Bible 
or how many times we pray, but if we really obey Him. That's what He's looking for. He's looking for obedience. If we love Him, Jesus says, you're going to do what I say. In fact, if you look at our next verse in John chapter 14, verse 15 and verse 21, let's read that out loud. You see, it's in your notes. Let's read it out loud together, beginning with, if you love me. Are you ready? Let's go. If you love me, obey my commandments. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. See, Mary's obedience showed that she loved Jesus enough to follow him to the foot of the cross. What does your obedience say about you? Your love for Jesus. Everyone makes someone or something Lord of their life. Whether it's success or fame or your career or another person. We're all followers of someone or something. Who or what are you following right now? If it's not Jesus, who or what has become the Lord in your life? Listen. Listen. Are you being obedient to Jesus with your entire life, with your spiritual life, with your dating life, with your finances, with your career, with your thought life? Listen, you can just trust Jesus enough to obey him. You can just look at the cross to see how much he loves you and how much he is willing to go through just for you as you see him hanging on the cross. He wants the very best for you. And I want you to understand this. Obedience always leads to God's best. It's always the best thing to do. Now, obeying Jesus, following Jesus, is not always the easiest thing to do. But it's always the best thing to do. See, that's the truth that leads us to our next lesson that we learned from Mary about following Jesus. Take a look at this one. Back in your notes. Here's the second lesson we can learn from Mary about following Jesus. Following Jesus leads to both joy and sorrow. This is hard for some people to accept because they think if I'm following Jesus, then it should always lead to joy. Maybe you thought when you first became a Christian, hey, listen, I, I'm a Christian now and everything is going to be great. It's going to be easy. And it's just going to be a bed of roses from this moment forward. Everything's going to be great. There aren't going to be any problems because now I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm going to be happy. But, but what we discover from Mary is sorrow is every bit as much a part of life as is joy. That sometimes following Jesus will lead you to the foot of the cross. Now, just 40 days after Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple for him to be blessed. And that's what every good Jewish family would do. They would take a child 40 days after they were born and to be blessed at the temple. We find that story for us found in Luke chapter 2, verse 27. And it says this. So when Mary and Joseph came to present, the, to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simon was there. Now see, Simon was a godly man who had been waiting his entire life. He was an old man to see the Messiah. And that's what it says. He took the child in his arms and praised God. There's the joy. And then Simon blessed them. And he said to Mary, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall. There's the sorrow. And then he continues, but, we will, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. There's sorrow. And he says, as a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And then the last part was directed specifically to Mary. It says, a sword will piss, pierce your very soul. What an emotional roller coaster. Honestly, sometimes that's what it, it's like to follow Jesus. The ups and the downs. There's those moments of joy, but also there are those moments of sorrow. You see, following Jesus is seldom an easy path. There may be times where you may be, uh, be dismissed by someone just because you are a follower of Jesus. You might lose out on a dating relationship because you, you're just there are some things that you will not do. You may lose out on a promotion because you're not willing to play ball like everyone else is in the workplace. It was true for Mary. The same is true for us. Following Jesus is not the path of least resistance. And I want you to get this. 
it is always the path of greatest reward. The greatest reward. That's an important lesson that we learned from Mary on the cross. That even though there are times of sorrow in this world, the cross shows that God will help you overcome the failure, any hurt or any loss, because Jesus has already overcome the world. That's what we see in our next verse over in John chapter 16, verse 33. Look what, what Jesus says. He says, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but what are those next two words? Take heart. Take heart. Underline those two words. Take heart. Some translations render those words to be of good cheer. Be cheerful. Have joy, it says. Take heart because I have overcome the world. Yet Jesus says, listen, this is life. And life comes with trials and sorrows. But take heart, I will overcome the world. Jesus is saying that if we follow him, he will help us overcome. No matter what we're facing right now, Jesus says, I will help you through those tough times. I will help you win in the end. In both joy and sorrow, it's important to follow Jesus no matter what. Then in joy and sorrow, there's something else that Mary says that we, that we learn. It's not something that you hear very much. Look across the page in your notes. Look at our third lesson. Following Jesus is filled with miracle moments. It's filled with miracle moments. Write that down. I love this about the Christian life. That when you follow Jesus, there are going to be moments that can only be defined as miracles. What is a miracle moment? Here's my definition. A miracle moment is an experience that happens in your life that causes you to say, look at what God did. Look at what God did. Something happens in your life and it's more than a coincidence. It's not something that you did or someone else did. It causes you to say, look at what God did. Now, a miracle moment could be something really big. But oftentimes, miracle moments are really small. That's the exciting thing about following Jesus. If you're willing to keep your eyes open, you're going to see miracle moments happening around you every day. Can you imagine for a moment how many miracle moments that Mary had during the life of of Jesus, her time with Jesus during their life. One of the first miracle moments that we find in the Bible that Mary experienced, it happened when Jesus was 12. Mary and Joseph had taken their family to Jerusalem for the Passover and they were traveling with hundreds of people from, their, from, their, uh, from, that, from that time and they and their family was with them and they headed back home after the festival and they assumed that Jesus was with the other members of the family. And then they discovered that he wasn't. They had left him behind in Jerusalem. They couldn't find him. If you're a parent, imagine the panic that goes through you when you realize you have lost your child. You don't know where he or she is. Then for a moment, think about if that child happened to be the Son of God. What she must have been thinking. The person that God had put in charge of his son. And she's lost him. What did she say? God, I'm sorry. I lost your son. Uh, I don't know where he is. That's why there probably was a lot of pain in Mary. And they had to go back to Jerusalem and they look for him. Look what happens in, in Luke chapter 2, verse 46 and following. It says, three days later. And let that sink in. Three days later. They don't know where Jesus is. They lost him for three days. And finally they discovered him in the temple. That's the first miracle moment. Finding your child after three days. What was he doing? It says, sitting among the religious leaders, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? Then that last line, and his mother stored all these things in her heart. I want you to underline that last phrase, his mother stored all these things in her heart. Here, Mary sees her 12-year-old boy schooling all the religious leaders on the scriptures and on his understanding of God himself. This is just one of the many miracles that 
she had with Jesus. But get this. Look at what she does. It says that she stored these things in her heart. She held on to it. She didn't forget it. She didn't put it off to the side. She held on to it tightly. She stored it in her heart. But Jesus wants you to experience miracle moments in your life as well. He really does. That's why it's so important for you and I to keep our eyes open for those moments that happen every day where Jesus is doing something that, that only He can do in your life. I can't tell you how many miracle moments that I've experienced in the churches that I've been a part of. They happen almost every day. Now, we don't always recognize them, but right in front of us, by the way, uh, salvation is a big, big miracle moment. Anytime someone says yes to Christ and receives salvation, that's a miracle moment. Or maybe you're in a small group and someone is ill and you pray for them to get better and they are healed. That's a miracle moment. Or maybe there's a marriage that's on the rocks and the couple comes to the church and they get plugged in and they join a small group and they get healed and saves their marriage. And God heals that marriage. That's a miracle moment. Or maybe there's a family that they're infertile and, and they've been trying for years to get pregnant and they are praying for it and all of a sudden they're able to get pregnant. That's a miracle moment. They happen all the time. An unexpected blessing. A door that was closed that becomes open. Those are miracle moments. You just have to open your eyes and look for them. Then don't miss this. Like Mary, when they do happen, don't let them just go. Just see them and let them go away. Remember them. <clears throat> Store them like Mary did. Store them in your heart. Write them down. Share them with someone else. Don't forget about what God did for you. Because I want you to hear this. When times get tough, when you're losing hope, those times of sorrow in your life, those miracle moments will help strengthen your faith. They remind you that God, what God is really doing, miracles every day, that you don't have to give up hope. You don't have to give in. Miracle moments, they give us hope. You know what Mary did? All these miracle moments that she had with Jesus, she stored them up in her heart and it allowed her to have hope even when she's standing at the foot of the cross watching her son being crucified. And I want you to take a moment right now and I want you to think of some of the miracle moments that, happened, that have happened in your life. When God came through for you, then let those moments give you hope. Remember, no matter what you're facing now, God will come through for you again. He can provide another miracle. As we follow Jesus like Mary, some uh, store those miracle moments in your heart. And then remember that in between those miracle moments, it requires faith. Look at our next. Uh, that's our next feeling. The, the next thing we learn from Mary, following Jesus requires faithfulness. Requires faithfulness. It's easy to remain faithful in those miracle moments. But following Jesus means being faithful even when things are all messed up around us, even when life is hard and not easy. You see, Mary was faithful even though she, she had to walk down through a very tough road, even though she was going to have to see her son executed. There had to be times when she felt like abandoning God's plan or going her own way. See, there was a point in time, we see in the New Testament, where Mary and Jesus' brothers tried to stop Jesus' ministry. In fact, we see that story in Mark chapter 3, verse 21. And I want you to look at what happened. It says, when his family heard what was happening, Jesus was teaching, he was healing people, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. This is his family. Jesus, my older brother, Jesus, my son, he has lost his mind. What Jesus was doing, he was turning the political and the spiritual world upside down. People were getting really mad at him because he was changing everything. And then they saw what was happening. They thought that he was out of his mind. So they go to get him. They go to collect him. They're trying to take him away, take him back home, lock him up in a room somewhere. And then it says this. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus. And someone says, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, who is my mother? Who is my brothers? 
Then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. First of all, that had to be hard for Mary to hear. Can you imagine? But I believe at this moment in time, this is where Mary had her come to Jesus moment. She had to decide, what was she going to do? What was she going to do with her role as Jesus' mother? Or was she going to continue that role? Or was she going to become a follower? What was going, uh, uh, was, he, was she going to try to force her plan onto him? Or was she going to follow God's plan? Mary had to make a decision. Was she going to hold on to Jesus as her son? Or was she going to see him as God's son and as her Lord? We know this. But we, we know this, but Mary made the decision, the choice from then on to follow Jesus all the way to the cross. You see, faithfulness is making that initial decision about Jesus and then making a decision every day after that to be faithful to him, to live your life for Jesus. Now listen, you have to recommit yourself to being a follower of Jesus. You have to recommit yourself to being faithful to him, to saying, Jesus, you're going to lead in every area of my life today. God, at work, in my relationships, at school, with my family, in everything I do, with everyone that I meet today, and, and you take the lead. You show me, Jesus. You show me the way. You call the shot. I commit to be faithful to you. And by the way, I want you to know this. Faithfulness is not perfection. It's not perfection. But you know what faithfulness is? It's growth. It's growth. It's taking steps towards Jesus, becoming more like Him each and every day. And God is going to reward that. Hebrews, 13, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, in your notes, it says, For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, underline that last, that last phrase, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Underline that. We will share in all that belongs to Christ. Then stay here just for a moment. Don't flip just yet, but listen. Mary was faithful to follow Jesus even to the cross because of that faithfulness. She now shares in all that belongs to Christ all the rewards in heaven. Let me encourage you because I know it can be hard to be a follower of Jesus when you're the only Christian at work. Or you're the only Christian at school. Or you're the only follower of Jesus in your family or in your circle of friends. But I want to encourage you today. Be faithful. Maybe there's some of you here today and right now you feel like giving up. Maybe you feel like giving up on a dream that God has put in your heart. Maybe you feel like giving up on God or walking, just walking away from the church. But don't do it. Don't give into it. Don't give up. Remember, God is with you. Be faithful. Trust Him. You've got a choice to make. In the middle of a trial, you can lean into God or you can turn away from God. Lean into God. If you do, He will see you through and He will bless you for being faithful. Flip over your notes on the back. Here's the final lesson. Mary teaches us about following Jesus. He said that to follow Jesus, we learn from Mary that it requires obedience. There are going to be times of joy, and there's going to be times of sorrow, and follow Jesus is, a full, is full of miracle moments, and it requires faithfulness. And then finally, on the back of your notes, follow Jesus demands complete serenity. If I had to sum up in one word, what it means to follow Jesus. That one word probably would be surrender. Mary surrendered herself completely to God's will. If we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to have to learn what it means to surrender ourselves to Him. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus talks about that. Look at what it says. He said, if any of you wants to be my follower, if you want to be my follower, you must Turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. 
You see, Jesus surrendered himself completely for you and for me on the cross. He surrendered himself on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that our relationship between us and God that had been broken, that had been severed, so we could be restored, so that we could have a home in heaven, so that we could be the people that God originally created us to be, to live the life that we were born to live. Jesus tells us, if you're going to follow me, then it requires surrender. That you surrender your life. That you surrender your plans. That you surrender your agenda. You let him lead your life. You see, it's not enough to say, okay, God, I'm going to surrender this part of my life, but not this part of my life. Jesus, you can lead this part, but not this part. You can be the leader in this area, but you definitely can't be a leader in this area. See, I'm going to keep control of my career. I'm going to keep control of my relationships and my finances. That's the part that I'm not going to surrender, God. No, to follow Jesus, we have to surrender everything. We have to give Him everything. Let me ask you this question. What area of your life today have you not surrendered to God? Your relationships? Your marriage? Your sex life, your career, your finances? Are there areas of your life that aren't completely surrendered to God? Maybe there's an area of sin in your life. We all have areas of sin, right? An area that we know is just not right. You kept it carefully hidden from everyone else, right? But it's an area that you have not turned over to God. You haven't surrendered to Him. Maybe you need to surrender that area of your life to Him today. Maybe it's something simple that God has asked you to do. For whatever reason, you haven't done it. Maybe there's a relationship that God said has said that you need to get out of that relationship, but you haven't listened to Him there. Maybe God has said, look, you, you never obeyed me. And, and, and been immersed into Christ. A simple step, but you haven't done it. But for some other reason, you, you know that there's something God wants you to do, but you have been delaying it. Whatever it is, will you surrender that to Him today? I'm going to ask um, Mary to come up, and we're going to get ready to, to sing a song. I want us to sing today. It's our closing song. I have decided to follow Jesus in just a moment. But as... And as she comes up, I want us to look at our final verse, our memory verse for this week. It's also a prayer for you. And I want you, I want it to be a prayer of commitment. Let's read that verse, our memory verse, out loud together, beginning with give yourselves. You ready? Let's read. Give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. Will that be you today? Will you make Jesus Lord of your life? Will you give him, give yourself completely to him? You know, the Bible, the posture of surrender is bowing of your knees before God. It's a gesture of, of surrender. And I'm going to ask you, um, as we pray, to get down on your knees, unless you really want to. But as I pray for us, I want us, I, I want us, I want to lead us in a prayer of surrender. And you would bow your head and close your eyes. Let this be a time between you and God. I want this prayer right now to be a prayer of surrender for you to Him. Let's pray together. Father, I want to pray right now for those who are here who are already Christians, who are followers of you. They say, I believe in you. But to be honest, God, I, a lot of times, like in my own life, I believe in you, but I'm not always following you. Let me ask you right now, is there an area of your life that you haven't surrendered to Jesus? You know how you can pinpoint it? It's the area of your life that is full of worry and fear, shame and regret. It's that area that is always stressing you out. Today is time to surrender that to Him. To say to Him, I don't just believe in Jesus, but I'm following Him with my entire life. Right now as we pray. Would you just say, Jesus, in my heart and mind, I 
I'm giving you that area of my life. I surrender that to you. Maybe there's others here this morning as we're praying that you realize that you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. You haven't done that yet. And I just pray that as we sing this song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I pray today that you would just give your life to Him. Listen, if you're, you're here today and you need to do that, come as we, as we close our prayer and, and come and make Jesus Lord of your life. We pray all this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand with me. You sing with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. And it's going to be our commitment song. Let's stand, let's sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. You got a decision to make. Come as we sing. Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. I'm so thankful um, that we can study these individuals who were at the cross and the lessons that we can glean from our lives and we can apply to our lives. So, Father, just help us uh, just to follow you and surrender you and give you everything. And as we leave this place, we ask you to be with us till we meet again. For all these things, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.